Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the news behind the news with Ralph Cantav on Mix 94.7 FM. Hoping that you had a good day. Uh, I am definitely looking forward to this uh, conversation. Uh, as established, you know, along the way, uh, any discussion about history, culture, any discussion, you know, with uh, one of our elders is always one that I enjoy. I feel as if, you know, I'm, I'm back in school <laughs> listening to you know, a, a wise person teach me and speak. And this afternoon I have here with me Miss Mulberry Pantaflet Ekstorf. That's correct. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the program and thank you so much for coming. Well, thank you, Ralph, for having me because it's always a pleasure to be home in first instance and secondly to, you know, be able to talk to people who are interested in particularly about St. Martin's history and in general about the Caribbean, you know, and what went down, as we would say now, or what's going up. Yes, indeed. Yes. So, so I remember um, years ago, I think it was back in 2014 or 15. Exactly. Yeah, when yes. I uh, met you through Miss Elsha um, from the museum. Museum in Phillipsburg. Yes, in yes. Phillipsburg. Mm -hmm. And I was blown away um, by so. your first book, which is yes. For a Stick of Fire. For a Stick of Fire. And I was, yes. I was even curious, why did you title it For a Stick of Fire? Mm -hmm. Of course, you I need to explain. But I remember, you know, when I had that interview with you years ago, as I've, you know, reached out to so many um, of our elders, yes. seniors, and St. Martin mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. um, and so it's great that, you know, now that you're back home, I'm able to not just document it from my personal archive, but now yes. I can share with the rest of the island. The pleasure is all mine. Great. Yes. So you know, as we begin, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? And then we'd like to hear from you, you know, what was it like growing up in St. Martin back in your day? Well, as you just stated, my name is Mulberry uh, Pondeflet, now uh, Echstorf Pondeflet. And um, I grew up uh, in the 1950s in Marigat Hill. And um, Marigat Hill was what they would call now St. Peter's, but we, we didn't call it St. Peter's in those times because what is now St. Peter's is all the hundreds and hundreds of households that are stationed there or that are there. That was at that time just what we would refer to as the pasture. Hmm. It was just pure pasture. No one was in sight in St. Peter's. They were like from the top of the hill, mm -hmm. you know, that goes to Marigo. Mm -hmm. Coming down that whole road, there must have been maximum of like eight houses wow. scattered along the road, you know, going down to what they now refer to as the L.B. Scott Road. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, more like a paradise-like kind of a situation. Not that there's anything wrong with it now, mind you, because that is progress, you know. The population has uh, multiplied and you need places to have people to live so it's not um, a negative comment that I'm giving because people think that oh well you know no I don't mean it like that but I'm just referring to the situation it used to be like uh, 60 odd years ago and what it is now so there was just uh, a couple of houses as I said scattered along the road going up to Marigat Hill and uh, those were mainly uh, farming people, because that is what you call people who cultivate the ground, you know, and uh, keep uh, cattle. They're, they're farmers, small farmers, but some had ca cows, cattle, as you would say. Some had what we used to refer to as small stocks, which was the sheep and the goat. And uh, others uh, had um, just a living somewhere in town, working for the government or something like that. So it was a completely different community that you could say, okay, it belongs to the category rural. Mm -hmm. It was the country. The country. As yeah. we used to say. Yeah, you indeed, know, indeed. so I'm a real, real, real. And I'm I'm not ashamed of it. I'm a real country girl from Marigat Hill. And um happy to be so, you know. And okay, so you you leave the island and you go away. But I always say you know, you can take the person out of the island, but you can't take the island out of the person. Indeed. So I'm still in in all depths and lengths, a Saint Martiner. Yeah. Although I've lived in uh, in the Netherlands for the greater part of my life, that does not mean that I don't remember my roots mm -hmm. and cherish them. Yes, to indeed. To that extent, yes. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And so, when you went abroad, to, uh, when you went abroad, I know you're an educator. Um, so, mm -hmm. where did you go to study, and what what was the inspiration for becoming a teacher? Well, um, I uh, when I was 16, I left uh, Saint Martin to go to the Netherlands to study teaching. 
And uh, at that time, our highest form of education here was what we refer to in those days as the MULO. Mm -hmm. And that would be like um, uh, from 14 to or 13 to 16 years approximately. And um, you would go to Curaçao sometimes if you wanted to further your studies, or you would go to the Netherlands. There was in those days, unless your, your parents had family in the United States, it was not a, a common, common thing to go mm -hmm. to the United States in those days yeah. to study. So it, you had just two choices, Curaçao or... And um, I can't remember the exact choice, but um, what that I made, but I ended up going to the Netherlands to study at the um, teacher training college. But before that, of course, I needed a in between intermediate, you know, um, an education which was in those days called uh, the Havo, still is, I guess, yeah. And um, so I had to finish, do that first, and then go on to teachers training college, which took in total the Havo and the teachers training colleges five years. And um, yeah, and after that, I came back. I worked here in Cold Bay teaching for a while. And then because of matters of the heart, if you understand what mm -hmm. I'm saying, mm -hmm. I, I went back to the Netherlands because uh, I went back then. I got married there and I'm still living there now mm -hmm. with my family. Gotcha. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, I would like to dwell a bit uh, in the child version of you. Yes. You know, going back to Margaret Hill. Wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. What was it like growing up? Uh, um, specifically even in that village, let's say. Yes. Uh, what were the things that, that stood out to you that, you know, that still put a smile on your face mm -hmm. when you think back yes. on your childhood? Okay, there are lots of things that put a smile on my face, but in particularly the community sense, although it was a very, very small community, and maybe because it was a small community, there was a, a sense of helping each other. And uh, although there was sometimes some radical... Uh, animosity between uh, you know one family with the other i'm not saying that it was a perfect garden of eden mm -hmm. but it was in general generally speaking you knew each other very well and uh, if there was anything going on you know someone would need a sack a bag of not a bag a pound of sugar or a pound of rice or something like that and you had it you would give it to them you know and um when children were being born and uh, in those regions, uh, there were no official midwives. So it would always be a neighbor who, um, who would come to the aid of the lady who was about to give birth. And she would help out and have the child enter the world. And um, I know of my mother, I was, I was not midwived when I was born, neither was my, were my brothers. It was always someone who helped my mother, and um, when it came to turn to the other ladies, she would help. And uh, wow. they knew perfect, and that is what I admire, because there was no official um, education in that field. So no but they house doctors that came to visit? Knew, yeah, well, in some instances, there were just two house doctors. They lived in Phillipsburg. I mean, so if the child is going to be born in the middle of the night, somebody would have to go into Phillipsburg, although the St. Rose Hospital was a fact in those days. Okay, eh? okay. Yes, but that um, you had to have transportation to get there in gotcha. time. And so, so it was more practical and um, safer to just run over by the, some neighbor and say, call in and the child come in, you know. <laughs> so, wow. yes. And were and you, have you ever witnessed it? Yes, were you well, in a room uh, I was not, uh, yes, I, I, rem I don't think I should call the names because that's private, you know. Mm -hmm. But there was uh, this large family extent, you know, uh, with quite some uh, children already uh, established in the, in the group. And uh, I remember one night um, there was uh, a knock on our door. At that time, we were living in uh, what is now um, St. Peter's, because I'm talking about two Marigat Hill hills, and one that is going to the bottom of the the um, the, the the hill that is Marigat Hill, mm -hmm. but then lower down, you know, the, the flatter area, yes. so to speak, yeah. that is also, we lived there. I lived up in the upper part where it was higher until about six years, I was six years old. And then after that, I was, you know, living, we were living where my mother's house still is. 
in the lower part of Marigot Hill. Okay. So I remember now to recall what you're saying. I remember that at a given moment there was a, a gentleman whose name I will not call. He came and he knocked on our door. It was the, must have been like two o'clock in the morning or so. And he said, Miss Mack, because that's the name my mother was referred to with. And he said, Miss Mack, the child come in. <laughs> and he said it very urgent, you know. And he, oh, so we, she got up and she said, wait, 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 I come in. So she scurried around in the kitchen and uh, took a bag and I have no idea what she was putting in it but mm. I, I think I heard her rattling in the cupboard where we would have things like vinegar and alcoholado and limacol and <laughs> all those kind of things you know mm -hmm. to disinfect because you need an antiseptic mm -hmm. agent you know for, for cleanliness they knew all of that automatically it was not, a, not an issue she put all of that in the bag and she told him to go on up so he went back up the road and she set off her running, as you used to say, you know, that expression. She set off her running <laughs> up the road. And in the morning she came back. Uh, it was must have been because it was light when she came back. And I don't know the exact hour, but I presume it was on a Saturday. So I presume it was, um, you know, like uh, eight o'clock or something like that. And she came and she said, um, yes, the child, the child is there. The child is OK. Wow. Yes. That's beautiful. Yes, and I heard about that child later on is now a grown man, <laughs> <laughs> I would say. And um, yes, that is, um, that's how things went. Mm. But those, uh, those rural situations changed quickly in the 60s. They had already started to change. And um, yes, with the, you know, the industry changing from a rural situation to, to uh, more like a tourism industry mm -hmm. or administrative you know, a uh, situation where people would work for government. And so everything, and then there was, of course, a more um, uh, people who came into from the, to St. Martin from the other islands in that they brought their own cultures and so on. So that is when, like in the 60s, the, the, not only the contours of the village, but also the mentality, because, you know, more people mean you don't necessarily know each other. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the contours changed and also the, um, the way of looking at each other as a community also changed. And I don't mean that negatively. Yeah, I have to always say that because uh, those, those things happen. Progress brings changes. Correct. And some changes uh, you would not want to see, but some changes are just good, you know. Yeah. So you have to take each item and each situation as it's worth for um, what okay. it means to the society. Understood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, given that you mentioned uh, basically in that rural setting, mm -hmm. uh, people, f a lot of people were farming. Were, yes. your, were your family also in the farming? Did your yes, parents have cattle father, and stuff? Yes, my okay. father had cattle and um, he used to supply along with Emilio Wilson, whom everyone knows, mm -hmm. you know, and some other uh, folks, I think the Scott family, they would supply all the town folks with milk. Mm. I know my, uh, of my brother, and um, I'm sure you're acquainted with him, Mr. Dennis Pantaflet. Yes. As a young boy, he would get up four o'clock in the morning and um, he had to go with my father to mil help milk the cows. My father would milk the cattle. And they would put them in bottles, the, and uh, he would take those bottles as a small boy in a crate, walk from St. Peter's mm. on foot. Eh? I'm talking. When I say walk, <laughs> I mean really walk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> walk from St. Peter's into town along, you know, come down the whole, L what is now the L.B. Scott Road. It did not have a name in those days. It was just called the road, <laughs> you know, the Coolsack Road. Yeah. So he came down all the way early in the morning, uh... It was around five by then. That was a daily chore that was his. Poor guy. <laughs> wow. Yes. At f uh, four o'clock in the morning, he got, they got the, the, um, the milk. Then it was bottled. And then they, he walked into town with the crate on his head and went into uh, up street where all the more affluent St. Martyrs of those days were mm -hmm. living. And he would, uh, they were sleeping. So he was allowed to come in their gates. Mm. I won't call their names. Mm -hmm. He was allowed to come into their gates and put down the milk by the kitchen door or by the door. And then he would go up the road, up the street and put it down at every, you know, he had his clients. Once he vented it out, he would go back out walking with the empty crate 
and go home and get ready for school. Yeah, I was just going to ask about Yes, he's getting ready. I thought, ready. I thought yeah, you so were going to say he's going to stay in town like to go to school. It was o'clock, yes. And, <laughs> and then he, by that time, he had come back home, and then he would go, you know how it is, you got to go bed, yeah. and you got to eat your Johnny Cake, and you got to drink <laughs> your tea, and then, you know, you wash and you shower. We could call it shower now, but in those days, it was a bucket. Mm. But you can clean yourself completely good with a bucket of water. I yep, know that. We <laughs> learned that after. I'm not especially. opting for that. I prefer my rain shower. But yes, yes. in those days, you could get clean with that. With a good bucket. And your soap. And you had to scrub with octagon soap. That was... Because the ivory soap was like, you know, for, for Sundays and stuff like that. But during... The <laughs> During the week, we had the rough octagon soap, and you would mm. even wash your hair with that, and it would become thick like a coconut mat <laughs> because of the alkaline, you know, things that were in the soap. It was a natural soap, though. So he would do that. He would come home and get um, ready for school, and then he would walk down the road to the beginning of to the end where we call the first well. The well is on Elby Scott well. Road. A, yes, he's, it still is there. I checked it uh, not uh, so long ago, a couple of days ago. Okay. The well is still there. I don't think that it is functioning now as a, you know, provider of water, mm -hmm. but it is still there. And that is at the junction um, um, going up Marigat Hill Road. So you pass the road that goes into St. Peter's when you're on the L.B. Scott Road. Mm -hmm. And you, you go up and the first turn in, as we used to call it, up the little steeper road that is now Marigat Hill gotcha. Road. And on that junction there, smacked to the right, there is a well. Hmm. And that was what we used to call the first well, meaning the first well. Gotcha. And that is why my website is called firstwell.nl. Uh -huh. Yes, <laughs> makes sense. First well, because that is my, that was a... It was like a, your landmark, basically. Yeah, that was a landmark, and it, is, it, only, it provided us with water for washing. We, we never used to drink it because it was an open source, you know, in the... Earlier days, it was just open. There was no covering. And I know the boys would go with a bucket and throw it in the well and draw water standing over a pit. I mean, I get goosebumps when I think about it. You know, those little boys, like six, seven, sometimes even uh, younger, going to draw water. That's how we used to call it. Draw water from the well. And you had to stand over the well, which was an open pit and throw your bucket down and I'm talking about meters down and draw it up and you know put it on your head with bush in it to stop it from you know um, flowing over the bucket and take it back home with your cutter on your head to you know to um, pad the weight of the bucket. Yeah, for those who may not, a cutter. That's a the thing, cutter. That's the, like when you wrap a yes. uh, handkerchief uh, cloth. No, no handkerchief. You had a special piece of cloth. Mm -hmm. Some people would call it a rag, but I find that derogative. It's not a rag because some said, yes, I know you used to put rags on. No, you never used to put rags on a head. It was a piece of cloth and you wrap it in a certain way. And um, people would think very easily about it, but you, can't, you have to know how to wrap a mm -hmm. cotta mm -hmm. because it's going to drop off. And then there you are with your bucket and everything goes splattering on the ground and the water is going to. So you had to wrap it with, you know, with knowledge and make a dent in the middle. So when you look at it, it looks something like a wreath of cloth. Mm. and uh, But it, the middle had to be still a little bit padded so that the cold um, bucket wouldn't touch your head, mm. you know, in the, the, the top of your head. So you had to, it was, it was uh, okay, once you know how to do it, it was not an issue. But I've seen people messed it up a lot because they think, oh, just put the cutter, just round it, you know, put it around, wrap it around my hand, put it on my head, and then the bucket. No, 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 no. You have to know how to do it. So, um... Uh, to to continue the um, the situation that you asked about with uh, my brother going into town and, and coming back up and mm -hmm. doing all of that before he went to school. So once he's ready, once he had all of that since four o'clock in the morning, he would go um, get dressed and take his um, books or whatever he had uh, and go down by the L.B. Scott Road by the first well. And there the tauna used to come. And I'm sure no one knows what the Tana was. Tana. The Tana. Yes, the Tana was a <laughs> was a concept. The Tana come in. The Tana was what we refer to now as the yellow buses. In those days, we had them. So that was know? our school bus. That was the school bus, but mm -hmm. it had this name. And I, I have been trying, Ralph, to research why it was called Tana. And yeah. I think, but I'm not sure, I think that there was something of an inscription by either by the tires 
or on the carrosserie, that's what you call it with the cars, right? I'm not technical. Uh, that it was something inscripted there from the factory that uh, made the uh, the buses mm. in those days they were parts that were imported and then they would be set together here by carpenters local carpenters so i'm not sure i have not found i would be happy to hear if someone has found out why it was called torn i think it was a corruption of some name uh so you know that uh, of a factory or something else gotcha that um made it be called that anyhow so the, the bus would come I, actually practically i think the same pl spot that buses um come now more or less on the lb scott road mm -hmm. and not all the people from all the children i should say from marigot hill would come down and wait there until the bus come and in those days we it accommodated uh, children from the friend side so they would walk over Chin yes Children from the French side, from Concordia and other, uh, even deeper into Marigot, they would come up the hill on the French side, come <laughs> over the hill, walk down the road. Imagine that in you the know, morning. Huh? Oh, your generation has some strong legs. We you know? have some strong legs. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, but not only that, we have strong minds. Yes, that too. Because... Uh, I don't see, and I'm not the, you know, being derogative about the youth nowadays, no, not for one moment, but I don't think that they would have the stamina that we had in the days to persevere. Because mm. if the Tana left too early because you had to go and stake out a sheep or whatever, and you, it wasn't there, you would have to walk to town still, you know, and come in late and all of that. So you made sure that whatever happened, you would catch the tauna. So, you you know, sometimes we used to look up the road up Marigat Hill where the, um, I can call that name, the family Rumu, mm -hmm. who used to live or maybe still are living. And you would see a white dot and a red dot of what coming down <laughs> the road fast as <laughs> lightning because they're running down the hill <laughs> nonstop. Hussein Bolt would be, you know, like yeah, can't, be shamed can't by them. He can't, he can't beat that one. They're coming down the road and to, you know, to get the bus. Because gotcha. if it's gone, then you have to walk all the way to Phillipsburg and back, maybe. Yeah. So that was um, the daily, you know, routine in those days. A hard life. But you know, Ralph, it was a hard life, but it was, you did not perceive it as such. And that it was hard. You just knew, well, this is what I have to do. And I think that it was, I'm not saying that we should go back to those days, because that would be nonsense, of course. But I'm just saying that um, it formed your character. Yeah. You knew what it was to persevere. Because if you did not persevere with this kind of thing, you would get nowhere. Yeah. If your father did not, uh, you know, get up in the morning and go all the way in the hills what we used to refer to as Gibbses, and I think that that is now, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the other side of, of reward. No, uh, I don't know. No? <laughs> no. <laughs> there, that's, that's a housing project now, and there are beautiful homes there. So you go, it's the... You um, mean uh, by Valley Estate? Beg your pardon? By Valley Estate? And uh, that's that's where the housing project is now. Oh well, uh, I, I wouldn't know those those newer names now. Eh? I'm okay. talking about uh, Ebenezer and okay. those kind of areas. Okay, just, okay. Uh, those were also that was pure bush. And, and rarely any homes there. Or any homes? At no all. homes at all. There no were, homes at all. No, 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 mm. no, no, no. Reward. That was where my father or my parents, I should say, uh, leased for years, leased a large patch of land that was designated for the cattle. It was grazing grounds for the cattle. Gotcha. The entire uh, reward area was nothing but bush. Yeah. You're right. Sorry. It, and I grass. Just, what just came to mind is true because um, mm -hmm. it wasn't until later, years later on, I uh, remember that's when um, Claude Wazi sat allowing yes. people to build there. And yes. then exactly. Camera, uh, I exactly. mean, sorry, yeah. Lewis. Yeah. Okay, yes, yes. yes. Uh -huh. I got you now. So it was um, a combination of beautiful tropical trees, palm shred trees, Kusha trees, <laughs> and uh, a couple of um, other, uh, how you say that, edible um, yeah. fruit trees. I'm, sh I'm sure you guys also were friends with Jack Spaniards back in those days. Oh, so. Jack Spaniards. <laughs> Jack Spaniards, was, uh, they were our largest enemies. <laughs> and um, 
<laughs> it was uh, some children were allergic to it, mm -hmm. and I still there. There's still some people who are extremely allergic, so yes. they were extremely afraid because okay, it stings and it's very painful. But if you're allergic, you know it's very dangerous mm -hmm. because if it hits you somewhere in the throat area, so you can't breathe. Yep. Or if it is in the nasal area, you know, like next to your nose or so. And they always come to your face. Yes. Because, yeah, you know, yeah. they aim at that. So that was very dangerous. And, oh, by the way, do you know um, why they are called Jaspania? No. Well, oh, some people say Jaspania, some say Jack Spaniard. But it was a name that I think the older folks gave to them who remembered the... Spanish conquistadores, if you look at the pictures now that you can find on the internet or so, you see the conquistadores, they have these striped uniforms, mm. like a yellow stripe uh, over black, you know, a striped costume, mm -hmm. or if you want to call it a uniform. And um, they were, uh, the, the, the idea of them being extremely vicious and cruel as most conquistadores were, I don't know, anyhow, you know, they, they want to conquer you, don't conquer with friendliness. No. I would, I would argue with that, but that was not what they did. So the Spanish had this name about being very rough, very annoying, and very, um, yeah, what we used to call disgusting. So, <laughs> just Spaniards were equally so. So, they called them Jack Spaniard. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. The conquistadors, and that is like a corruption later on because the Jack Spaniard looks like that uniform, you know, the yellow and yeah, the stripe. black stripes. Mm -hmm. So they became Jack Spaniards, and then afterwards it was boiled down to Jack Spaniel. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah Jack, which is Jack Spaniel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, of course, you know, other languages take it over, so it would be like looking nothing like Jack Spaniard, mm -hmm. but that is where it uh, derived from. Gotcha. Yes. So, so mm -hmm. well, one of the things also come to mind, mm -hmm. um, you know, because this is this is a debate we've been having since school as mm -hmm. far as it relates to St. Martin's national dish, uh, but that, of course there were different variations of dishes that mm -hmm. you know we eat. Besides Johnny Cakes. Yes. You know, and mm -hmm. so growing up in, in your mm -hmm. time, what exactly was a typical meal throughout the week? Mm -hmm. And I know, I think that Sundays was, was the most special was, day. Yes, uh, Sundays was the most special day because then most of the time you had um, uh, meat. Mm -hmm. In fact, actually, we lived, at least uh, the rural folks, lived a more vegetarian lifestyle. So more plant based. You could, you could call, yes, plant based food because. Um, Okay, you had the salt fish, and you had the salt herring, and you would have an occasional um, uh, batch of meat from someone who had butchered uh, an animal, a cow or a pig or a goat or a sheep, and uh, you would corn that, because way back in the 50s, at least we did not have a refrigerator, and so did most of the other homes in the cul-de-sac area did not have that. So, you know, it was, um, preserving the meat was, uh, was quite a, sh a chore. But um, the main dish that uh, I always cherished, and that was during the week, that would be the, um, <laughs> the pigeon pea soup. Can't go wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. And, uh, and, and it, it sustained us uh, to a great extent, and in particularly because of the, I know now what the nutrients were and uh, the nutritious value of pigeon peas, and they're, they're very, they're stuffed with vitamin B. Mm -hmm. So when you got a whole portion of that and you eat it on a daily basis, then, you know, you had to be strong. Because it's 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 in your it's in your you know it's in your food. Yep. So, Plus you're active mm -hmm. as well. Yes. Yeah. And then of course there was the fish. Uh, uh, the fish would come. The fish uh, gentlemen, this the fishermen would come up to Marigot Hill on Saturday with their catch, and um, you would go to the. Uh, they would stand like down by the junction. Uh, that I was just talking about, and be between Marigot Hill and um, this L.B. Scott Road, by the well, or sometimes they would, according to how much they still had left. Sorry, yeah. fishermen from where? Simpson Bay. Simpson Bay, okay. Yes. The Simpson Bay men were the fishermen. Gotcha. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
in those days. Huh? And uh, they would have their catch early in the morning. And when you heard the conch shell blow, because they would come and they would stand down by the um, well. And of course, uh, you know, shouting like I'm here or the fisherman is here, that wouldn't work. But the conch shell sounds, you know how a uh, conch shell has a strong yes. sounding. Mm -hmm. I mean, that could, that tra the sound of a conch shell travels. If you know how to blow it well, it's also an art. If you know how to blow it well, it will carry for miles. Hmm. Yes, because there is a... Anyhow, no, that's too technical. <laughs> <laughs> there, but there is a way of... Um, Blowing the conch shell and it sounded, and especially in the in the the Kulsak area, which is a valley, valley yes, it exactly. would you know resound. So you hear, you always hear that, and then you would see the cutest sight I would find, uh, you know, of the women with a bowl running down <laughs> to the truck and you know taking their pick of what was left because you had to be fast because somebody else was going to take uh, your, you know, everyone wants the best for their family. Yeah, so the fat fish. mullet or whatever yes, was there. Correct. That's gone if you weren't fi <laughs> fast, you know, Ralph. You had to just run down, take, you know, <laughs> hold up, you double your frock, your frock so right? between <laughs> your legs be before it blow out with the wind and just scatter down the road and get your fish, mm. right? And I remember even there was instances sometimes they didn't want to come up to Marigat Hill. They would be going into Phillipsburg with their cats, so they would come around uh, what used to be by the by the cemetery, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in cul de sac, the, yep. the, the road leading up uh, at now the LB Scott Road. So they would pass there and they would go straight to town. And my mother would always send Dennis, my brother, poor boy. He was the errand boy. He, that boy really walked, I tell you. <laughs> Not only walked, he ran. And he had to go down very early in the morning. She said, go down, here's the bowl. And she would give him like uh, 50 cents or something like that. And go down and by the, by the road. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me, and wait for them and uh, catch catch the uh, fish fish fishermen the Simsimbi people. That's what they used to call them, not derogatively, but that was just a name. Yeah, you know? gotcha. Uh, and um, bring up a strap of fish because the fish was trapped in portions, and meaning most of the time they were not loose. They would you know bind a couple of fish through the gills together with like the green um, uh, um the snake plant they would make strips from that and then they would string the gills of the fish onto that so you would have a strap so it would be like a parcel of fish all bounded together and you can pick, you know, sometimes I would have one big one and a small, a whole bunch of small ones. And so for the sprats, they would always be like a bowl or so. So you had to bring something with you. But in order to get the very first um, pick, you know, the, the best of the lot, so to speak, you would have to go down to, to the road there by the cemetery and wait until they came around the bend and uh, get your stuff and then run back up with the fish. And sometimes it was very hot, you know, even early in the morning. I don't know if, I think that there's some kind of a climate change, but I'm not sure. I haven't researched that so, with, with figures, so I can't say that for certain. But b by the time sometimes he reached up Marigot Hill, you know, the fish would start to um, like, okay, a fly would come, you know, and so you had to clean it quick and salt it and vinegar it and uh, lime it and all of those things and make it nice and, uh, you know, nice and fresh again. Mm. So, yeah, the, the fish and the fungi was always there. Mm. The, the, to answer your question about the food, the, um, the pea soup was always there. And, um, you know, the pig snout and uh, soften it up of, you know, sweeten it up with other things. But sometimes, most of the time, it was just, in our case, then it was the, um, the pigeon peas and the dumplings. Hmm. The dumplings were really um, the, the creaming of the of the soup. The cattle tongue. You're looking at me. Cattle tongue. Uh. <laughs> cattle tongue. Cattle tongue is a, a dumpling. Eh? Oh, so that's what you call it. You used to call them cattle tongue. Why? Because they had this, you know how a cattle, yes. a cow tongue would yeah, look. It's okay. elongated, yeah. oval, and it has a dent in the middle. Mm. So they would roll the dough and uh, flatten it out in an oval shape and then they would put you know the the the, the fist dent make a dent in the middle and that was for structure that it would boil faster mm. then you what were doing it was not just to pretty it up but it had a function the dent in the middle because it wouldn't float and it wouldn't you know 
Gotcha. Uh, yes. Yeah, so it, it, it had a function and they would make this elongated thing and a couple of those would be in the soup. And once you get that, you know. Good to go. Good to go. You were a king or a queen then, I should say. You know, eat your soup and all of that. Nice. Yes. What? Are there any stories um, from your parents that you remember? Um, and I have a question as well. So in that regard, uh, as far as slavery is related, did you, did you guys ever grow up hearing any stories of um, you know, those who survived slavery on St. Martin? And was that something you ever researched? Uh, well, I have not um, researched that yet because uh, if I... If you follow the course of my books, I'm now in the process of, excuse me, I'm now in the process of my third book. And I started actually in the 1950s with the first book about the stories we are, tell we are talking mm -hmm. about now. Eh? Mm -hmm. And then my second book was about uh, the Second World War. So I go back like 10 years earlier. Uh, and that is the era of the World War that no one seems to know anything about. And most of, the most of the time, if I say World War II, then everybody dismisses it immediately as, oh, but that is about the Dutch, that is about uh, England and, you know, the, the colonies. And it is about them, but it's not only about them. And I try to stress that. Mm -hmm. So that is what I did in my second book, A Different Stick of Fire, uh, World War II in the Caribbean mm. and I called it Fragments of a Forgotten Legacy because it's also ours. The history of the Netherlands in the World War, the history of France in the World War, the history of Britain in the World War mm. is our history. Without us included in that uh, narrative, it's not complete. And in my book, I expound on why I say, and it's not me saying that, I research it extensively. And once you're into this subject, there's an enormous amount of documents that you can find uh, that will um, substantiate the claim that we were an enormous part of the World War. And if it wasn't for our, uh, our input... When I say our, I mean the entire Caribbean, the British Caribbean, the French Caribbean, and the Dutch Caribbean. There would not have been a victory, and we would not have been, I'm absolutely certain that we would not have been sitting here today in your lovely studio and talking to your beautiful audience out there. Because the enemy of the colonies in those days were immediately also our enemy. And if they had won... Knowing the mentality of the enemy, I mean the Nazism mm -hmm. and, uh, the, you know, everything that had uh, to do with uh, Hitler. If they had won, I mean, they were already planning to with what they were going to do with the, at that time, colonies. Yep. And that was not a good thing. No, that <laughs> would not have been that they Definitely would have. Not. I, I don't need to expound on that. I mean, yeah. it's obvious that we would have been either used uh, for some obscure and deep, dark, uh, you know, um, situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We would not have we would not have survived. So um, coming back to your question. Um, Story. I go yeah. back. So it was about the 50s. The first book was about the 50s. Mm -hmm. The second book is about the World War era, which was, you know, 1940, 1945. And now I'm presently using, I go back a little bit further, and um, I should not be saying it, but I will, um, you know, I will uh, say that it's about the times when um, the, Panama, the um, Panama Canal was built. That also had an impact. I try to look at things that have an impact on our society. I did not come to slavery because that was further, further away. Mm -hmm. So there will come a point that I say, okay, I'm going back in time from the 50s to the 40s. And then from the 40s, I go back to the 30s and the 20s when the Panama, 20s, the Panama Canal was being built. So I'm researching that now. And later on, I'll go back and find there are lots of significant blocks of uh, how you say that? If you can block the uh, time, you mm -hmm. know, um, time frames, I yeah. would call them, that have been that um, the Caribbean in general, not only the Dutch Caribbean, but the whole region has been so instrumental mm -hmm. for the development of the, the world, world in general. Yes, and slavery is, of, of course, 
an enormous part of that, but it's following my timeline of research, it is further away. Yeah. You understand? So yeah. I am not really, although of course I know an extensive amount of, 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 of uh, I have an enormous amount of information about slavery. I have not researched it and put it in a, in a perspective like I have done with my yeah, books yet, books, yeah. you know? But I, uh, if you are referring to um, oral, um, oral situations, oral stories, yes, yeah. because um, believe it or not, my father, Prince Albert Pontflet, they used to call him Mr. Butt, from Bert, you know, Albert. Mm, Albert, and yeah, <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> That's how we say Albert. That's one of the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Butt, Mr. Butt. And um, he was uh, an immediate... Uh, Descendant, I would say, from from slaves, because uh, he he remembers a lot of um, the situation that was just. He's from 1891, mm. and actually from earlier, because he was a very proud man. He always said he was born in 1981, but when it comes to the nitty gritty, he was born earlier, because he was uh, in his 80s uh, when he passed away, and I was just 14 in those days. So, I was what they call a uh, Benjamin of the family. So. <laughs> yeah. But he would tell us all kinds of uh, situations that were just, as you would say, out of slavery. But the mentality of uh, the slave owners was still there. And he would, he would tell us about uh, how he um, rode in, he drove, uh, I shouldn't call names, right? He, this prominent family in, who has property still in cul de -sac. And um, how he would drive them in a carriage with horses, driven by horses. And uh, on Sundays, they would go over to the French side and uh, all of the things that they used to eat. And it was actually, when he grew up, it was still like a structure, a deleted structure, if you will, of what slavery was. So by the time he was a little boy, it was already officially... Uh, banished, mm -hmm. but there was still, you know, the, it still lingered on, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, yes, yeah, so, and um, but he he was not really too keen, and we never understood why. He was never too keen on expounding so much on those uh, stories, and we never really got the chance actually to uh, to say well what was it exactly you know what was what was it like gotcha yes so um i can't i can't of course there are stories that um that you hear but those are oral stories and i i prefer to use uh, narratives that i know are completely true and I trust my father's judgment, of course, so I know what he told us was always the truth. But if that was, um, if you can, like, generalize that to the whole community, I can't say that. Mm. Okay, understood. Mm -hmm. um, so, your title of your, your first book and the second one is mm -hmm. For a Stick of Fire. Yeah. What does that mean? Where did that come from? Well, uh, For a Stick of Fire, that was an expression that was used and still is. When you go and visit someone for a very short time, eh, you know, because it's used nowadays too, you know, like, uh, okay, they're passing by and they want to give you something and they, okay, the person who you're going to is, is standing there waiting for you and you say, well, you know, I can't stay long. I'm just coming to give you this or that. I just come for a stick of fire. Mm -hmm. But most of the people, they still use that expression. I've heard it used several times, even up until the uh, day before yesterday, as we would say, yeah. Mm. For a stick of fire, meaning a short time, I don't come to sit down or, you know, have a, a being into, I don't need to be entertained because I'm leaving shortly. I just come for a stick of fire. But uh, most of the people who use the expression do not know where it originated. Now, for a stick of fire, you would go, picture this, you, it's six o'clock, dust is starting to fall. And you want to prepare your pot, you know, because in those days we never used to eat so early because people in a rural situation, they had to see to it that the cows got water and the sheep got water and that they were staked out in the in their yard. And um, there was no not much time until after the cows and the cattle or whatever you had 
were taken care of and then you would go home and then you know the women would start doing their part mm -hmm. so now you would you picture this um if i may make a little sketch for you to understand where this forest stick of fire came from you would be sitting you know you would be preparing for your to get your meal and that was outside most of the time like the three stone thing you know, the three stones yeah. stove, I would call yeah. it now, because it's a stove. You know, people say, yes, but it was not a stove. It was just three stones. I said, it is a stove because it has the concept that a stove has. And that concept is you prepare your meal on it. So you put down three nice flat stones. They stayed there in the, in the rain and everything. And you put your wood and you lit your wood. And then you put your pot on top of that with a grid. Mm. That is how it used to be done in those days. Of course, there were people who had other types of, you know, a real um, stove or oven or whatever. A cold pot was also there, but uh, for the um, most of the people, they had these stones outside. And you would look, and all of a sudden, you go in, and you say, "Oh, I don't have any matches, right? You don't have matches." But it was not a problem. Remembering what I just told you when we started out, saying it was a helpful community. You help each other. So you would look up and you would see like a smoke trickling from somebody up the road. And you knew that they had a fire going, mm. right? So you would take a, a, an old um, tin can and you would, most of the time it was always the children who had to do these chores. The mother would say to the child, listen, go up there. You go up there and run to Miss uh, so, so and so, so. Yeah. and ask her for a stick of fire. And sometimes... You would go, if they had coals, it would be coals. But generally, you would just go along, and when you reach close to her, you would pick a stick, a dry stick, from some branch or some, you know, shrub that was growing along, and you would run with it, and you would say, I come for a stick of fire. And she would say, yeah, go ahead. And you put the stick into the fire until it catch. It would, should be a substantial stick, though. And those are also knowledges that seem so simple. Well, you would know that. No, you don't know that unless you've had, you've experienced it. Because the stick had to be a stick that would keep the fire until mm -hmm. you get back down. Mm -hmm. So you would poke the stick into the fire until it catch. And you would have to know and look and see good. It's going to out, as we used to call it, fast. Or it's going to still be burning when I reach back down. Because then you, your mother's going to send you back up. Go back to sticking. Go ding on the fire. Keep going. So you... <laughs> You would have to know, you understand? Yes, You yes. would have to know exactly which stick it is you, you're going to pick. So you pick a, a substantial stick and you, you, lit, you, lit it, you light it by the fire of the, uh, the neighbor. And then you stick it in the, um, in the can. And why you stick it in the can? Because with the running, it's going to start flaming. And because the wind is catching it, mm -hmm. you know, so it will burn faster. So you stick it in there so it would be protected from the wind. Mm. And you run back down. And you would give your mother your stick of fire. Stick of fire. So the stick of fire, you couldn't stay there when you had already lit your stick because it's going to burn out. You understand? Mm -hmm. So you, this stick of fire thing means just a short while for a stick of fire. Lovely. And uh, the reason why I named my book that is because uh, I was told by someone long ago when I had uh, given the idea that I was writing a book in in verse about uh, the 1950s and uh, I was naming all the chapters that I had already uh, you know set up they said but that sounds like a thick book Mulberry I said yes it's going to be a thick book and someone said to me but you know you shouldn't write thick books because especially the youth is not going to be interested in it if it's thick I said no but the way I'm going to write it it is just small bits and pieces mm -hmm. you know I write uh, I think I have over 200 items yes so you can take the book you don't have to begin from page two and then all the way back to page three what is it 300 and something you don't have to do it like that you just you know you open the book and you leaf through it and you see a chapter that you like and you read it and you put it away mm -hmm. so you go to the book for a stick of fire you a go shortly of... and very briefly yeah. you get what you want yeah. you put it away and that's it next day you can do it yeah. with another story and that's what I loved mm -hmm. about the book because mm -hmm. uh, I remember when I when I got it I was like man this is a book anyone can read literally yes. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a you know, snapshot or bite size yes, stick of yes, fire yeah, of yeah, Samaritan yes, history. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, exactly. the livelihood and stuff. Yes. Well, mm -hmm. I would like to uh, uh, talk about your second book. Um, yes, my second book. Yes. You briefly mentioned mm -hmm. you know, uh, it relating to the World War. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what in your research, you know, I guess, 
give you that light bulb like hey i have to publish this and can yes. you detail what what uh, the content of the book yes. as well okay thank you uh well first let me say what my um always was my motivation forever not thinking that i would really do it but the th- ideas that i played with from the time I was a child, uh, growing up in, in the same Margaret Hill, uh, Margaret Hill I'm talking about, I used to hear my father, you know, on leisure afternoons when they're finished with hard working and so on, and they got, the guys would come around for maybe um, a drop of rum or something like that, and they would be sitting out on the wall and talking to each other. I recall some of his old friends saying, hey, boy, but you remember when they had... Um, when the Germans them and Hitler had tried to bomb Aruba. And I was like four, four years old then, but it stuck because in my mind, like what, bomb Aruba? I didn't know what bombing was. I didn't know where Aruba was. I was four years old, never been anywhere else than further than Phillipsburg. Like that was the <laughs> end of the world for me in those days, you know, four years. And, um, but it stuck in my mind, like what, um, what was so important and then, um, my father would reply in, in, in with words uh, to the effect of, yes, man, I remember that. And they were out for us, you know. It's a good thing they didn't get us and all of those kind of comments, you know. But I did not understand exactly the context of what they were talking about. And then later on when I started to go to the, when I went to the elementary school and I would um, talk with, European teachers that were here and they would sometimes say something about the war you know that was in Europe at that time but I always found that they were referring to it of course because they were Dutch they would be referred to it the war in in Holland but then I would always ask them why was it called a world war if it was only Holland it was and those were questions that they dismissed you know because I was a child then later on I always had the hopes that when I go to at that time the Mulo that I would get when you get history and the world war two would be discussed you know you had to drill it in your head 1940 1945 and all those kind of uh, facts I was always hoping that oh now they're going to tell us something about um about uh, St. Martin or the Caribbean in general. You never heard a word, never. So I had to take it on me like, okay, at a, at a given moment, if I ever get the time and I can do research, I would want to find out for myself how extensive this contribution of the Caribbean was in winning the war. Mm-hmm. Not knowing that it was that vast. And when I say vast, not knowing that it was so important the Caribbean for winning the war for the Allies, Europe and the United States, Mm -hmm. against Hitler, that Hitler in 1942 sent um, U-boats, submarines, down to the Caribbean and jeopardized all lives here Mm -hmm. and in the other islands. Mm -hmm. And then I started, um, it was like a puzzle coming together. You know, you had these little pieces yeah. that you hear, and then all of a sudden it's like, really? So see picture. They were here, because that is what my father used to tell me, that uh, tell us then, or tell his friends, that, you know, you would look out and um, go in in Phillipsburg, and you pass in the alley, the alleys in Phillipsburg, and you would look out on the sea, and you would see suddenly something emerging out there and it was not a boat at that time the people were not familiar with the concept of a submarine submarine wow Wow. but it would be german submarines out there and what were they doing here they were uh, trying to uh, bombard the flow of oil which was extremely important for winning the war yeah and they would sometimes they would get lost but that sometimes they would be just heading towards um, the inner Caribbean because yes. they would come all the way from France because in France that was where they used to have the in, in the Second World War they had the, the um, submarine pens that were stationed there and they would just cross the Caribbean and come sorry cross the Atlantic and sneak into the Caribbean and the Germans were extremely versed yeah. in navigating all of the channels that we have you know you have all of those channels between the islands Mm -hmm. and some of them were very dangerous and particularly for you boats they could get grounded or they could get what but they knew exactly and they had been here for quite some time they Mm -hmm. were circling around this was not that it was unknown country for them and um 
they even had a name for for the war that they would be waging against the the pr suppliers of oil in the Caribbean. They call it Operation New Land, New Land, and that was pertaining to the whole Caribbean area. Mm. So it was a target. It was a definite target for the Nazis to to come here and disrupt everything. And in doing so. They had, of course, um, changed everything in those years for the Caribbean. Because, you know, when you talk with like, uh, okay, you can't compare suffering with, one, with, with, with uh, one suffering with the other. But when I talk to authentic Dutch or European Dutch people, war, and they say, yes, but we suffered a lot. We suffered a lot. And I was like, yes, you did. But um, we also in the Caribbean suffered maybe in a different way, but we suffered, we suffered also. Because during the um, blockade of these, uh, by these German U-boats, and there were mostly, there were some from Mussolini, there were some Italian too, but there were also, most of them, the five larger ones that caused, uh, that caused such ruckus, if I could call, use mm -hmm. that word here in mm -hmm. the Caribbean, was ger of German make, yeah, make, made, were German made, and they were circling around, and what would that mean for fishing boats? Yeah. So people in St. Kitts, in, in, now all the Caribbean, in Nevis, in Stacia, for instance, in Sabre, Sabre was excluded, or how you say that's, um, was by itself marooned actually for two years nothing came in no food children died because there were no supplies coming in on the they had to do with what they had on the island in wow, the 1940s it was a very very hard time and not that. only you know not only these islands but i remember and then i understood what my mother used to tell me about yes but she did not connect it with the war but she was saying, yes, she didn't know what was happening, but she remember that in the 1940s, 1942, 1940s, so many people died because children got sick. There was no medical supplies. No doctors would come from anywhere into the country because she said, I don't know why they couldn't come. But later on, I understood it because the, uh, the, the submarines were circulating like, uh, like crazy like sharks. and stopping indeed because they had a wolf pack that is what they used to call mm -hmm, it too. they mm -hmm. had these wolf packs mm -hmm. and they would attack everything that looked like uh, a f uh, you know a freighter or whatever and I also have in my book for instance one of the people and whom I admired for his role in that is Mr. David James he's now passed and he was um he was one of the people who would supply the islands with, uh, with you know, food stuff and, and all of that. Also, during the war, he had a substantial role in maintaining uh, the health of people. And when no one would be able to come in, you know, with food stuff or with medications or what have you, he was still uh, running back and forth with his boat from, for instance, uh, St. Kitts to St. Martin and vice versa. Wow. So it had an impact the World War had such an extreme impact, and I just uh, dislike the fact that people dismiss it as, oh, yes, but you guys were just down there lying in the sun. No, no. <laughs> while us Europeans were up here fighting the Germans because the Germans were out for you too, but we were the ones fighting them. And that is true, they were the ones. But it, this was, but that is not the whole story. Too, as well. That is yeah, not, not a whole, whole story. story. You have to tell the story as yes, it was. Entirety. You know, otherwise it's a lie. And that goes so. to the uh, the quote about um, the story of the hunt, right? Uh, yes. Whether it will be told by the lion or the hunter. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so the it's lion it's is, a <laughs> yeah. The, the, and the lion gets bigger and stuff like that in the stories of the um, of the hunter. <laughs> yes. So um, what I what I uh, what is also a fact, you know, Ralph, is not only that um, there was starvation because of that on the islands because nothing could get in or nothing could get out. Every communication between, for instance, uh, the people uh, who went to Aruba and Curacao. They had stopped all of the um, the, the the trailing of the, of the boats. The schooners did not, you know, the schooners did could not dr um, do their work on the waters because they would be torpedoed. And in torpedoing boats and everything that looked like a like a boat, they 
changed actually the U-boats changed the whole um, co um, concept of what the Caribbean Sea looked like. And in fact, in those days, it, the Caribbean Sea was turned into a watery grave for many people. Hmm. I have here, if I may, yes, the yes. story about, uh, which I documented, and uh, the story about uh, Mr. Richardson. I have to find it. Um, who it was, who worked, George Richardson, he has family here. The word, the name Richardson, of course, rings a bell, but mm -hmm. the Richardson is a large family, so... One would have, I, if I may read yes, uh, yes. a piece we'll of ahead. that, and we'll it's in ahead. the book, there's A Different Stick of Fire, World War II in the Caribbean, Fragments, Fragments. of a Forgotten Legacy. Mm. So this is a piece that I have here, and you can see I uh, did some of the, because I don't have any pictures of him, of course, but so I did some little... Um, uh, depiction. Uh, yes, depiction of, of, yeah. of, of what he was, a stoker. So Mr. George Richardson, and this is titled No Grave But the Sea. As a stoker, or what you would call a fireman, at work in the merchant navy, George Richardson must have been constantly challenged mentally as well as physically. His job was firing up the ship's boilers, keeping the ship moving, literally. The engine room down below was his domain, a dangerous place when engaging the enemy. Now, you must understand that people like George Richardson, he was very young when he uh, went to sea. Mm -hmm. They would have them, even captains of, of boats who had their own boats, once they were employed by the uh, authorities in those days, actually, they would have jobs like being stoker. So they would be down in the belly, as you would call it, of the ship. The ship. And they would have to be keeping the fire going, you know, because that was the technology in those days. Mm. And uh, they were like sitting ducks. Once you're in the belly of the, uh, the, the ship and it is torpedoed, you have nowhere to go. So you're like what they call rats in the, in the um, you know, in the catch. You can't get out, sorry. You can't get out <laughs> or anything like that. So mm -hmm. it was extremely dangerous. And uh, the underneath part of, as you can understand, the lower part of the ship would always be the target. So once you were down there s doing your work and, uh, you know, setting up the fire and keeping it going so that you would move forward, you were also a sitting duck for, for the Correct. Germans. So that was very, very, um, very dangerous jobs they were doing. And this one is um, about this gentleman, George Richardson. And I know someone on the French side who knew his family, knew his great-grandmother, mm. and they remember him going to sea and remember him never coming back. Wow. Yes. And um, he, he is a representative of all those young Caribbean men who took part uh, in, in, in this, um, how you say, this journey, actually. It was your job, because some people say, yes, but it was your job to, you know, work on the ships. Yes, but you did not ask for a war. Mm -hmm. You asked for a job, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you must never um, underestimate the, um, the fact that they stayed. Because when you go to work on a ship in those days, you know, you go as a uh, deckhand or you go as a cook or you go as a regular sailor, seaman, you do not ask to be put in a situation that any minute you can be bombed to death. Yeah. Uh, and, and then and you uh, have to yeah. understand the colonial factor. Yes, um, also. Usually, you know, especially when they had um, Caribbean workers come aboard, or even in their bases, yes. you have to do the most strenuous yes. work. Yes, yes. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, yes, that you are the first on the front line the to yes. die, etc. Exactly. So, yes, yeah. that and the Chinese uh, workers, they, had, yes. they were of the same poor, deploring situation that they would get these dangerous jobs that uh, mm -hmm. the others would not, r would refuse to yeah. do. yes. And it always meant endangering your own life for your livelihood, and mm -hmm. that is, that is very hard, because so, you want to do, you want to work for it, but you don't want your life being threatened every time you go to work. Correct.
and, and this was the case. And that yeah. boils on to in training that the, the, the right narrative is told, basically. Yes, exactly. So mm-hmm. where can people uh, find both of your books? Oh, well, uh, the, there's, a, there's no stock right now of the first book, which will soon come, and I'll notify you when that is the case. And, um, but A Different Stick of Fire can be purchased at the museum right now. There's a, a small stock in-house. Oh, the museum so. in Phillipsburg. Yes, in the museum in Phillipsburg on Front Street, yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Heritage Foundation. Okay, great. Mm-hmm. And there's one more thing I wanted to ask you. I was curious about uh, who you touched on briefly because, uh, you know, I, I do know that you know, back in the day sometimes, so, you know, now we say we're going to a different district, but you, know, you guys just say villages and so mm-hmm. forth. Um, and like you mentioned your brother having to deliver milk to yes. Up Street <laughs> and then it was... Um, well, we know what Down Street, and then mm-hmm, there's, mm-hmm. I think, in between was called Midtown, yeah, basically. Yes, yes. Um, but what what would you see you know, as a child? Uh, were the things that stood out to you as as it relates to um, the weekend and the type of games you played, and mm-hmm. you know the more livelier stuff? Yes. Well, the weekends, of course, uh, starting with uh, with the Saturdays, was always the um, the ritual of cleaning the house. <laughs> St. Martiners were extremely cleanly people, still are. But in those days, you know, Saturday come, you had to um, brush out the house. You had to sweep. You had to wash your clothes. You have to do everything, hang them up. And the Sunday, of course, which still is, that is designated for church. And you went to Catholic or Methodist Church? Methodist Church, okay. yes. The Methodist Church was uh, the church where we always, uh, you know, went to. And that was literally holy. Going to church was a sacred event. You could not skip that, Ralph. Mm. Whether you wanted to or not, you know, you had to go to church because that was what decent people did. You go to church on Sunday and you go in your best attire and um, you listen to what the minister had to say. You go after that. You go to class with a leader in front and, you know, and then you sing your hymns and, okay, we went back home. But, you know, the town folks, of course, they just trolled back home. But we had to go all the way back mm. to Marigot Hill. Now, try doing that in the hot sun with a nylon dress on. <laughs> 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 Pretty, but mm-hmm. oh my gosh, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, foo. But that was... Uh, I that, guess that made lunch all the more... Um, that made lunch savory. all... Yes, oh <laughs> yes, yes. Because And then, you know, as we just said, these Sundays would be, even if you did not have meat or any other type of uh, protein during the week, Sundays were always, uh, there was always meat. Mm. Whether it was mutton or, you know, pork or somebody just butchered a cow. Did you guys eat much chicken? In those days, no. You know, when the chicken eating, no. The chicken thing came into vogue, as I would say, or into the staple, shortly when people could refrigerate stuff. Mm. You know, because I remember the, um, we did not know the concept in the 50s about chicken wings. You had a whole chicken, but that was a chicken that you fed with corn until it got big enough for you to... You know, butcher. Yeah. And uh, so you were eating uh, your own chicken. And uh, there were not many of those because, you know, if you eat the chicken, you can't get the eggs. It's either one of the two. Mm. So uh, the chicken thing came in. I remember that when that came in into vogue that it would be like frozen parts coming from Puerto Rico. And uh, you could, you know, make your uh, dishes with that. But uh, before that, it was not so much of chicken going yeah, around. No, 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 no. Another thing that mm-hmm. uh, also came to mind is I know, um, you know, politics is still to this day a significant part of life and St. Martin, our discussions and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, were there any stories or political figures that come to mind, you know, growing up that, uh, that, still, that you still remember? Of course, of course. Um, Naturally, it was Mr. Cloud Wati that everyone was talking about, but someone who was also prominent in those days was Mr. L.B. Scott. Okay. And uh, then you had uh, Mr. Jose Lake, mm. who was uh, of the National Party, and he was, uh, in, mo- in our opinion, one of the few people who were, uh, you know, strongly opposed to Mr. Cloud Wati, and who was brave enough, if I could use that word, to stand up and say, well, you know, I have a different opinion of things. Uh, There were, like, um, a lot of patriots in those days. 
but um, very few who were uh, versed in um, keeping meetings and 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 like and Mr. Scott, Mr. L.B. Scott, Scott, he was one of those people, you know, he would organize a lot and he was what we used to call in those days an upstanding figure. Hmm. I was too too young to understand exactly if I would be agree with what he was saying or not, you know, but uh, I know that his statue was was large in those days. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah especially in that valley. Region. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And he was also one of the first entrepreneurs that um, the cul-de-sac area had uh, had produced because he was one of the first people who had a uh, a bulk station, you know, a gas station, and um, which was uh, extremely important because in those days, like in the 60s, that was when people started having cars, just a few. And a car in Margaret Hill, I can tell you, that was like a uh, uh, an alien ship just landing from some other outer stellar. So you, uh, <laughs> you remember when you saw your first car? I remember seeing, no, well, I have to say that um, Mr. Scott, who had a bakery, mm -hmm. he, he had a car in okay. those days. But it was, you can tell, I, I say always, if you want to see if something is strange or not in a, in a, in a certain area, just look at what the dogs do. <laughs> and <laughs> I have to laugh. I'm sorry, but when the when a car, one occasional car, would come into Marigat Hill, the dogs went completely Crazy. mad, <laughs> and they would try to bite the car because Hello. you know bite the tires and would be, it would be like a string of twenty fifteen dogs <laughs> running behind this car trying to bite the tires up because it was an alien thing, mm -hmm. you know. So. Mm -hmm. Those those are the funny th aspects of it, but um, it was real. It was very it was very odd to see a car coming up. Uh, plus that the roads were not so good for cars in those days because mm -hmm. you know you had these rocks protruding out and they were like uh, almost like sharp knives, you know, digging into your tires. Yeah. So you had to be very careful when you came into Marigat Hill and you drove a car because mm -hmm. you never know when you might get a puncture or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. You see, so yeah. And, um, but those were like the, you know, the regular things in life. But uh, overall, you can still say that they were all upstanding people. Hmm. Uh, there was hardly any, um, how do you say that, benign feelings. Of course, there was this little jealousy here and there and it, because we're only human, right? Mm -hmm. But there was no strain. Then you would have like little feuds between families, and that is also, I think, uh, still present. So, yes, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that was not typical for that era, but it would be quicker solved. And uh, for instance, if you talk about when Hurricane came, even though you did not what we used to call didn't talk to this person or that person. If hurricane came and you needed a shelter, you could go by the same person that you was just what we would call cussing yesterday. <laughs> They're mm. not going to let you out in the in, in the rain or whatever. They will tell you to come in. Mm. And that was the sense, you know, of community, this community sense that was then. Yeah. You still provided for, even though this person was your so-called yeah. enemy, N against nature, you can't. Nature is such a force that we all have to band against it. So when hurricane come, you come by, I, by okay. us. Right. And then you would be safe. Which is something in, uh, I compare it, and that might be a strange comparison, but uh, I compare it with the, the situation that I hear other Europeans talk about during the war, that you would hide certain people if they were being sought by the Germans. Ah, yeah. Even though you did not like the person, when they come, you know, knocking on the door, you might take them in. Yeah, provide them And that shelter. has always been a standard, and since that, and not only, it's very strange, but because of my experiences with the hurricanes, uh, one hurricane, which was 60, which was also Donna, was a bad one, and that is one I experienced, and uh, the community sense in those, in those few days formed something in me that I said, you know, it is a... A catast catastrophe is always like a um, a mark that you can set. Like, okay, when you think of people in general, you know, sometimes it's hard to picture. Is this person someone I would want, to, uh, I appreciate or not? Is this someone I can trust or not? When it comes to the aspect of trusting people, I always take 
the hurricane situation and the, from Europe the, the war situation as uh, a matter of um, taxing what this person means to me. Hmm. So if there's someone whom I would, you know, I'm not sure of, can I trust this person? I always picture in my mind, suppose it's a hurricane now. And this person is, you know, around, living up the street or whatever. Would I go to him mm. or her and say, you know, my house, my roof just got blew away. Can I come in? And then I picture what would that person say? No, go away. Or keep, you know, keep going about your business, as the old people used to say. Or would they enter me in? And immediately, Ralph, I'm sure you know this, you would know. In your heart, you would know, even if the person is not nice to you. In your heart, you would know that this person, yes, if my house blew off now, my roof blew off now, and I have no way to go in this person, I go to this person, they definitely will say, yes, come in. And for others, you would say, oh, that def, no, I wouldn't even go there because although we talk very well and we laugh and chat and hail each other, they will not let me in. When it comes down to the nitty gritty, they will. And that is like a general, from the time I was small, that is a general idea for me. I, I also do it with my son, who is of uh, bi, um, biracial, who's biracial, if you want to use that word. And from the time he was a little boy, I would always tell him that story. I say, you know who are with you or for you by asking yourself if they're, because here in Europe, and there are no hurricanes there. So I use the analogy of a Nazi or invasion or, yes, razia, if you want. And I tell him from the time he was small, you always know who your friends are because sometimes he would come home with, is that my friend? Saying in Dutch, is that, is that a friend of mine? And it's too heavy, you would say, for a child. But children understand that. I say, mm -hmm. so if, there's, if these things happen and they come for you, would you go by that little boy or do you think, no, I'll go to the other one? And they know immediately, like, yes, I have this feeling if I go to this person, this person is going to do as if they don't know me, like mm -hmm. they'll go away or close the door or something. Mm -hmm. And no, I don't go and play with him or her, but I know for some reason they will take me in. So it's been, the hurricane had such an impact on me about helping. And the stories I ha heard from the Dutch, uh, my Dutch uh, relatives and friends, I know exactly that it is a, a matter of, uh, you, you can use it as a sifting system to sift out hmm. the, the would-be friends and the real ones. Wow. Thank you so much. I think yes, that is definitely <laughs> a great mark to end this conversation. Okay. Um, yeah, that that is some serious wisdom there. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. But thank you so you much, oh, Miss Mulberry. I mean, it's always a pleasure to speak with time you. Time flies. Yes, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> really. <laughs> thank you for having me. another hour. Yes, but and your friend, your visitors, or so your yeah, readers. To all of yeah. our listeners and mm -hmm. viewers as well, those mm -hmm. on YouTube, thank you. Thank you. I hope that you guys enjoy this conversation and do stick around for the next one tomorrow. Take care.